All right, good morning. Welcome to the Tuesday morning men's Bible study. I want to invite you to go ahead and grab some coffee and a donut and then grab a seat. We're going to get started this morning. My name is Paul. I'm one of the pastors here at Park City's Presbyterian Church. If you're new with us, welcome. We're so glad that you're joining us today. Uh, this spring, we are working our way through a topical study on the attributes of God. And so if you've missed any of those, of course, you can go back to our website and find what you've missed. At this point, we've done an introduction from Romans 1. We've talked about the holiness of God and the sovereignty of God, and today we'll talk about the love of God. We'll get into that in just a second, but I want to make a couple announcements. One, we want to make sure that you have a table group. So if you've not yet gotten a table group, please go see Melissa, and she'll make sure that you get into a group by design. We want to teach, and then we want you to break up into groups, except for today. We're throwing a little bit of a wrinkle today. Now, what we have an opportunity to do today is to put... God's love into practice. Uh, this just came across uh, our desk. Uh, we have an opportunity to help put some boxes into a truck. Who doesn't want to do that at 7.30 in the morning, right? Uh, if you've been around our church, you know that we have missionaries all over the world. And one of those places where we have um, great missionaries serving is in Ukraine. And over the last many, many months, as the war in Ukraine continues... We have been a hub for our denomination, the Presbyterian Church in America, to collect crates of relief uh, from really all over the nation and then to be sent out over to Ukraine. And each of these crates has all kinds of different items uh, that the, the church in Ukraine has been sending to the front lines. It's pretty amazing. And so we have about 200 crates across the street uh, that have been sent from you know, all over this region. Uh, to be sent over to Ukraine, and they are needed to be put onto a truck. The truck's getting here at 7.30. So if you're able, and you might not be able, and that's okay. If you're able to uh, stick around right, after, uh, right at 7.30 when I'm done teaching, go across the street, help put one of those on the, on the truck. Honestly, if enough of us do it, it'll take like 10 minutes. Um, what I would love for you as uh, one of your pastors is I would love for you to do that and then still meet in your group. <laughs> that would be great. I know not all of you can do something like that with your work schedules today. And so if you're able to go put, you know, your group maybe goes together and puts some crates on a truck and then goes and meets for a little bit, that would be great. If you're not able to do that, totally understand. We know we're springing on this on you in the last minute, but a great practical way uh, for us to show the love of God um, to the world. So I'll talk about that more at the end uh, just to remind you, but again, a great opportunity for you this morning. Uh, we're talking about the love of God today, and as we think about the attributes of God, it, it makes sense for us to think about His character systematically, and some of you have probably heard of the term systematic theology, and that's important because it helps us break these things that are lofty and big into categories. It does not serve us, however, if we try to pull these attributes apart as if somehow they don't interact with one another. And where we find ourselves today as we work our way through these attributes is I want you to begin to see how the attributes of God are to be held sometimes in tension in ways that really um, stretch our theological imaginations. When we say that God is holy and we say that He is sovereign as we looked in the last two weeks, it's not as if these two things have nothing to do with any, one another, right? In fact, his sovereignty has something to do with his holiness, his otherness. As we talk about God's love today, it's not as if his love has nothing to do with the fact that he's holy, or as we will look at next week, the fact that he is also a God of wrath. We hold all of these things together, and in fact, in its fullness, it gives us a bigger picture of God, but also helps us understand the depths and the beauty of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I want to show you this. Uh, again, uh, week one, I, I read to you from our, uh, our confession and the Westminster Confession, the Westminster Catechism, some of those great definitions of God in our traditions. Uh, I want to read another one to you. And again, in the same way as we looked at a couple weeks ago, every single of these words has a footnote and a scripture reference. And I want, to, I want you to hear as I read this, all of these attributes and the way that they are all fusing together and sometimes in tension, okay? 
So this is from the Westminster Confession of Faith, chapter 2, which is on God and the Holy Trinity, all right? Now, this is going to be a mouthful, which means it's also going to be an earful this morning. I know you're still just waking up. I want you to listen to each word and how much is being said here in the confession. There is but one God, living and true God, who is infinite in being and perfection, a most pure spirit, invisible, without body, parts, or passions. Okay? Now it's going to get into attributes. Immutable, immense, eternal, incomprehensible, almighty, most wise, most holy, most free, most absolute, working all things according to the counsel of his most immutable and righteous will for his own glory. Okay, we just heard the holiness of God and the sovereignty of God, what we looked at the last couple weeks, but it doesn't stop there. Listen, he is most loving, most gracious, merciful, long-suffering, abundant in goodness and truth, forgiving iniquity, transgression, and sin, the rewarder of them that diligently seek him. That's what we're talking about today, that he is love. But the confession doesn't stop there. It continues, most just and terrible in his judgments, hating all sin, and who will by no means clear the guilty. A God of judgment and wrath. That's what we're going to be looking at next week. When we think about the attributes of God, we can't just pick and choose, but they all flow together. In his person, who he is, as we come to know him, we see a fuller picture of who he is. So as we talk about God's love today, I want you to think back on his holiness and sovereignty, and I want you to anticipate that he is also a God of judgment. Because when you put all these things together, not only do we worship him, fall down on our face to see who he is, but we also truly begin to understand the way he sees us and just how amazing that truly is. So today we're talking about the God of love. We're going to pick up where Pete left off in the book of Romans. So if you are with us last week, Pete focused on Romans 8, in a particular part of Romans 8 that talks about his sovereignty in verses 28 through 30. This morning I'm going to pick up with verse 31. He touched on this briefly and we're going to dive in deeply. You're going to need a Bible. We're going to be all over the scriptures this morning, but our anchor is going to be Romans 8. So turn there with me. Let me read it for us, and we'll jump in. It's Apostle Paul in Romans 8, verse 31. He says, What shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Jesus Christ is the one who died. More than that, the one who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is God's word for us this morning. Let's jump in. As I said, as we think about these attributes and we think about how they fit together, as we think about God's love this morning, I want to think about it from an eternal perspective. I want to look back on His love before the foundation of the world. I want us to look about how He loves us now in our present and how He will also love us to the end, that God's love as part of His character as an eternal God is eternal itself. And that's going to be very important as you think about the way that he loves you. So the first thing I want to say is this. God loved you before the foundation of the world. God loved you before the foundation of the world. Look with me, verse 31. 
As Pete mentioned last week, this section of Romans, Paul begins to ask some rhetorical questions. Paul does that quite often in his letters. And here he's beginning to ask these rhetorical questions, anticipating the kinds of questions you might have as a hearer of this letter, as a reader of this letter about God and how he relates to us. And one of those might be this, what should we say to these things? Well, what are the things he's talking about? Well, throughout Romans 8, he's been talking about the reality that we are not condemned. For those who are in Christ Jesus, there is no condemnation. Verse 18 He begins to talk about the suffering that we experience in this life, and that's going to be important as we talk about God's love towards the end. But as we experience sufferings of life, those sufferings can't be compared to the glory that is to be revealed. Then he starts talking about God's sovereignty, and he starts talking about how he's working all things together for the good of those who love him. And now he's asking this question, well, then what do we say to these things? If God is for us, Who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also graciously give us all things? So what's his point? Well, he's saying, who can come after you? If you are a follower of Jesus, this morning you're a Christian, You've trusted in his death and resurrection. You have received the kingship and lordship of Jesus, and you are one of his followers. Paul's point is then, what are you afraid of? As you experience suffering in this life and difficulty and strife, if you are loved by the eternal God, then what can come against you? If God, the creator of all things, the one who holds all things, the sovereign and holy one is for you, then what possibly could come against you? And his proof of this is the cross itself. That God, if he graciously gave us Jesus Christ, his own son, to die in our place on the cross for our sin, to rise again that we could have life. If God, the Father, gave us the Son, then how would he not graciously give us all things? That he has given us everything in Christ. And as you think about, well, why did God do that? I want you to understand that that plan to give us Jesus, that plan was put into motion long before you existed. Before you ever sinned, before you ever did a good deed like going across the street and putting a crate on a truck... (laughs) Before you ever thought of trying to somehow earn his love for you, or before you ever did something that would not make you worthy of his love, God put a plan in motion to give you his son. Why? Because he loved you before the foundation of the world. If you have a Bible, I want you to turn to the book of Ephesians. Again, this is the Apostle Paul. In many ways, using similar language as he's using in Romans 8, as we looked at last week, this scary Presbyterian word, predestination, God's sovereignty and our salvation. But again, as we looked at last week, I want you to see why that is good news, and that the doctrine of predestination is actually born out of love. It's born out of love. Ephesians 1. Paul says, Ephesians 1 verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing. So again, if God gave us His Son, how could He not graciously give us all things? Notice the similarity of language. God has richly blessed us. Why? Because He loved us before the foundation of the world. Verse 4, even as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before Him. Listen to this. In love. He predestined us for adoption for himself as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace which he's blessed us in the beloved. In the same way that sometimes we can pick apart the attributes of God, we often take Bible verses out of context 
And notice, if you look with me at verse 5, he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ. That is glorious on its own, that he would choose you and I, sinful men who are not worthy of salvation, that he would set us apart and make us holy because of Jesus is glorious on its own. But that's not the whole story. Look at the two words that happened just before verse 5. In love. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ. You and I, because of our sin, are orphans. We are on our own. We chose our own orphanhood. We left the family. And yet God loved you before you even left in your sin. He loved you so much that he sent his son to die in your place so that you who were an orphan would become sons. That love existed before you sinned. That love existed before you did anything in your mind that might even be worthy of his love. And as we're seeing just a second, For a second you think this has anything to do with you, you do not understand the love of God. God loved you before the foundation of the world. You've probably heard me mention this uh, story before, but I love it so much I couldn't just mention it again. I I think I've mentioned it before in a um, men's Bible study some years ago, Uh, and probably around the uh, the time that he died. But Eugene Peterson was a Presbyterian minister. Uh, You might uh, be familiar with him because he made a translation of the Bible more almost like a commentary called The Message. And uh, he died some years ago in 2018. And at his funeral, his son spoke and, of course, gave a eulogy. And I love so much what his son said about his pastor father. I love it because, like all good eulogies, if you do it well, it has a little bit of a jab. It's funny. But also he honors his father in such an amazing way. This is what he said. He said that his father had everyone fooled for almost 30 years of pastoral ministry. That really, with all the sermons and all the books that he wrote, he really just had one message. One sermon that he repeated over and over and over and over again. And it was the same message that his father would preach to him as a little boy when he would sneak into his room at night and whisper in his ear. And this is the message. God loves you. God is on your side. He is coming after you. He is relentless. Well, if you're going to preach just one sermon, that's a pretty good one. What I want you to see this morning is that's a deeply biblical sermon from Ephesians 1 and Romans 8. God loves you, and because he loves you, he's coming after you. And because he loves you, his love is relentless. He is for you. And before the foundation of the world, he set his affections on you to the point of sending his own son to die for you on the cross. Most famous verse in the New Testament, if not the Bible, John 3, 16, what does it say? For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Why did God give his son? Because he loved you. He loved you first. Second thing I want you to know. Now, not only is his love eternal, as we look back and see it existed before the foundation of the world, but I want you to know his love is present. He loves you now. If you are a follower of Jesus, he loves you now. And that is so important for us to wrap our heads around. In some ways today, it's going to be easier for us to look back theologically on his eternal love or even to look forward on his promises that we'll do at the end. And the hardest thing for us to grapple with is that he loves you now. (laughs) Despite all the things that you have done in this week, all the thoughts you've probably already thought this morning, all the ways that you will sin against him even this day, he loves you. 
Well, how do we know that? How do we receive that kind of love? Look with me, verse 33. Paul asks another rhetorical question. Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? In other words, and he's going to use this question in just a second, a charge, a condemnation. Who can accuse you? And I want you to think about the places that you receive most of the accusations in your life. What are the voices in your head that say, you are not worthy? You are not worth His love. You are not lovely. Well, we hear those sometimes from other people. And if you grew up with a father who was harsh or spoke those kinds of things to you, there's no doubt that that trickles into the way that you view God's fatherhood over you. Sometimes we hear those from coworkers, other people, but probably for most of us, the loudest voice of accusation comes from ourselves, doesn't it? And so often we wallow in that place of shame, thinking that we are not worthy of his love. One of the names for the devil is literally the word accuser. He whispers accusations to us to tempt us away from God's love. But this is what's amazing. We see in John 4, and well, John 3, in the beginning of the Gospel of John, as uh, Jesus' ministry is beginning, and he's tempted in the wilderness. This picture of Jesus and Satan coming to him. And what does Satan do? He takes God's word and he twists it. He takes truth and he uses it against Jesus. Well, Satan does the same thing with you and I. Because here's the truth. Are you worthy of God's love? No. No, you're not. Neither am I. But that's the beauty and majesty of the gospel. Satan wants to stop there, but there's more to the story. You are not worthy of God's love, but God loves you anyways. Why? Because that is who he is. God loves you because he is love, not because you are lovely. And in fact, he loves you so much that he is going to make you worthy of his love. Through his son Jesus and the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Let me show you what I mean. Why don't you go to 1 John 4? If you're with us last semester in the fall, we went and worked our way through this amazing letter. And for some of you who study this, you know, it's easy to already forget the things we talked about. And in 1 John 4, there's this entire section on love, God's love for us. And all of this, John says, means we should love one another. But of course, it's rooted in his character. He loves us because that's who he is. We're called to love one another because that's who he is. I want you to look with me at 1 John 4, verse 8. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. John's saying it's impossible for you to really know who God is unless you recognize his character, who he is. He is love. And as I mentioned in the fall, so often when we read that, God is love, what we try to do is put a human conception of love on God. We try to make him in our image. We say, oh, well, God is love. And therefore, when we wrestle with the problem of evil, which is real, or the suffering we experience in this life, which each, and I, each, each one of us, each and every day, will experience some amount of difficulty and strife and even suffering, Or we even wrestle with what we're going to talk about next week. The Bible teaches us not only is he God of love, but also God of judgment and wrath. Then we say, well, as I think about a human understanding of love and put that on him, then I want to make him in my image. And say, well, my God wouldn't be like that. But see, that's not what John's doing. John's not saying, well, let's make God in our image and put a human understanding of love on God. No, he's saying God is the one who defines what love is and helps us understand what it is. And the truth is, every one of us, we need our vision and our definition of love actually to be corrected by the character of God. God is love. It's who He is. Now, what does that love look like? Well, He tells us. Verse 9, In this the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent His only Son into the world so we might live through Him. And this is love. In other words, you want to know what love is? This is what love is. Not that we loved God, 
but that he loved us. There it is. He loved you first. And sent his son to be the propitiation of our sins. God, before the foundation of the world, loved you. God loves you now. How do you know? Particularly when you feel unworthy of his love, how do you know? Because now, in Christ, you stand justified. Go back to Romans 8. This is Paul's point. Who is to bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. You can't justify yourself. No amount of making yourself more lovely, more worthy of his love will make God love you any more or any less. God is love. That's his character. And so he loves you now because you have been justified in Christ Jesus. That is who you are now. That identity is true for you now. You have been covered by the blood of Jesus now. And so God loves you. But it doesn't stop there. This is amazing. Romans 80 continues. He says, well, who's to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who is raised. And listen to this, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Not only do we know that God loves us now because you are justified in Christ, but experientially. God loves you so much that now Jesus lives to pray for you. Apostle Paul just said that Jesus is interceding for us. Notice that's a present tense word. Jesus, who is risen from the dead, who is now alive and seated in the heavenly places at the right hand of God on the throne, is praying for you and for me. Why? Because he loves you. We see similar language in the author of Hebrews. The great preacher talking about Christ as our high priest. And he says this, Hebrews 7, verse 25, that Jesus always lives to make intercession for us. Same language. He's praying for us. So what does that prayer look like? Well, I think one of the greatest examples of what this probably looks like is in the Gospel of Luke. And this is Peter. And if there's any of the apostles or the, the disciples that we can relate to the most, often it's Peter. He's constantly putting his foot in his mouth, constantly doing the wrong thing. And just like you and I, he turned his back on Jesus. <laughs> and yet, Jesus loved him and restored him. And in Luke 22, this is what Jesus says to Peter. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you, that he might sift you like wheat, but I prayed for you, that your faith may not fail. And when, notice when, you've turned again, strengthen your brothers. Jesus prayed for Peter that his faith would not fail, even in the midst of turning his back on him. And in the same way, I believe Jesus, because he loves us, is praying for you and I, all who are in Christ, that our faith would not fail, that we would endure to the end. That's the last thing I want you to know, that God will love you to the end. He loved you before the foundation of the world. He loves you now, and he will love you to the end. Look with me. Verse 35, who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword He goes on and says, verse 38, I'm sure that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present or things to come nor powers, height, depth, anything in creation will be able to separate us from the love of God. And notice where he begins in verse 35. He's talking about the physical difficulties of this life, the circumstances that we face often in our suffering. And as he works his way through to verse 38, suddenly what's physical becomes very cosmic and spiritual, recognizing that the physical difficulties and suffering of this life have a spiritual reality of a cosmic war where we are being afflicted by principalities and powers of evil over this present darkness. And Paul is saying none of these things, not one of these things, not any difficulty in this life and not even Satan and his kingdom itself 
can separate us from the love of God. Nothing. That's amazing. That's amazing, and that gives us great hope this morning. Because so often, we tend to view God's love for us through the lens of our circumstances. In other words, we look at our circumstances and the difficulties of this life and say, if my life is difficult, you must not love me anymore. Rather than looking at our circumstances through the lens of God's love. And when you realize God will love you to the end, then whatever we face in this life, whatever difficulty that might come our way, we see that God is sovereign and he loves us and he will use it for good. Nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. There's a word, it's where I want to end this morning, for that. And the word comes from the Old Testament. The word is hesed. It's God's covenant love. Your Bibles will often translate it as his loving kindness. I've said time and time again, my favorite definition or translation of the Hebrew word hesed, covenant love, other than probably covenant love, comes from the Jesus Storybook Bible. It's a children's Bible. And this is Sally Lowe Jones. She calls it the never stopping, never giving up, unbreaking, always and forever love. God loves you covenantally. That is, he loves you permanently. He loves you with an unbreaking love. The love that a husband has for a bride. A love that is born out of promise. A love that says, I will love you to the very end. There is nothing that can separate us from that kind of love. An unbreaking, eternal love born out of God's character. And because God is love, he has poured out his love on us through his son. And he's given us the gift of the Holy Spirit to work that love deep into our hearts that will follow us all the days of our life until we pass on into glory or he comes again. That is God's love for you, brothers. Receive that love today. And now bear that love to the world. If you're able to stick around, we'd love for you to make your way across the street, Oak Lawn, and come stack a few crates. And then if you're able to stick around longer than that, we'd love for you to then come back, find a spot, and stay in your groups. If you're not able to go across the street, please, no shame, no obligation. We know many of you might need to just meet in your groups and get on to work. We totally understand. But if you're able, have a little free time this morning, can go across the street, come join us. We'd love for you to do that. Let me pray. Father, help us to receive your great love for us in Christ Jesus. Help us to know that you loved us first before the foundation of the world, that you love us now and that you will love us to the end. And help us to see that all of this really has nothing to do with us, but has everything to do with you, your character, and your attribute of love. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.